it's becoming more and more common that structural engineers need to assess existing structures for modification and reuse. This is due to pressure on cost and impact on the environment. And it requires you to have a unique skill set that needs to combine both site investigations, understanding historical material and construction methodologies. How to analyze these unique structures and what aspects do you need to look out for when you're strengthening them? I'll be covering all of these, but where should you start? You should first start off by starting your desktop study. This will allow you to work out the age of the building and the construction methodologies used at the time. So you know what type of material they're using in the structure. What is the strength of the reinforcement in the structural elements? What is the strength of the steel work? Are you expected to see tapered beams or a more modern design? So this helps you with your site inspections that you perform later to see if there's been any future modifications. Also requires you to dig through the archives as sometimes street may have changed names or it may have been the street adjacent to it. So you may need a broad range of assessment to find the actual name of the building and the historical data associated with it. When inspecting the existing buildings, it's important that you have some historical context of how the building was constructed and the type of materials they would have used. So you can have an understanding of where the deficiencies may lie based on codes, practices, construction methodologies, and any known historical deficiencies. So what does a site investigation entail? Well, it inquires you to go out to site, and this will be after the structure has been stripped, so all the architectural finishes have been removed. As if you've got architectural finishes on top of the structural elements, it potentially hides defects underneath them. Looking for the degradation, cracking, or signs of distress, You'll also be looking for potential other modifications or changes to the drawings that are not actually documented. So are all the columns lined up as expected or has there been some future modification that's caused additional transfer loads? Has the building degraded over time so it will need to be repaired to some extent? Is there specific signs of distress like the structure is not actually held up as well as it should have? So potentially pointing to areas that are under designed or need modification or strengthening? Or has there been future modifications that you have not known about that are not on the documentation that have caused specific defects in the structure, as these areas may require more detailed assessment? And the investigation may not just stop there. For example, if you're trying to put core holes through a structure, you need to know where the steel reinforcement is. You can see what reinforcement they're putting on plan, but where it's specifically located is impossible to tell. And you can do this through a non-destructive method of radar scanning the slabs. What this allows you to do is locate those reinforcement bars in each direction so you can accurately put the core hole right through a location which will not lose any reinforcement. The scanning is very limited though as it only really provides a limited data of where those bars are and how deep they are. You cannot accurately tell what the diameters of those reinforcement bars are. So if you need to confirm the reinforcement in the slab, for example, you don't know it from the documentation or just to confirm to make sure you're accurate with your assessment, you need to expose that reinforcement. So you need to remove the cover of the reinforcement and physically measure the bar in the concrete. You may also want to confirm the strength of the concrete in the structure. And how I'd recommend you doing this is through taking core samples in specific locations. Again, you want to scan that slab so you don't cut any reinforcement. As a reinforcement bar in your core that you're crush testing will invalidate the results. And these results are only really there to validate the strength in the material and the strength gain over time as typically you do not take enough samples to make it statistically equivalent to what strength the whole overall slab is. So for example, if you get a significantly higher result, it does not mean you can assume the higher result across the whole slab, because maybe you took a really good portion that was cured well. There's also other methods that people may encourage you to do. And this is things like Smith hammer testing. Smith hammer testing typically is very variable in its results. What it's great for is detecting defects in the structure. So picking up voids or changes or inconsistencies in concrete strengths or knowing that this concrete is harder than this concrete. It's really hard to tell accurately what the strength of that concrete is without those additional crush test results. So it's only really there to test the integrity of the structure, not really the strength of the structure underneath. So I'd be highly skeptical about any Smith hammer results you get and relying on them in your design. If you find this content on structural strength and informative, don't forget to strengthen the like button. Not only does it help me out, but it also helps me work out the type of content to create for you. So now we come to the analysis portion. So we've undertaken our desktop studies, collecting all the historical data, performed our site inspections and realized that there was no signs of distress or degradation and it is as per our documented design. The first way we should start analyzing that structure is looking at the client brief and look if there's any ways that we can propose that there is no need for structural strengthening of the existing building, as this is really the best way forward and the most cost-efficient solution. 
Have you actually modified it enough that the load path has actually changed or you've increased the stresses in the building? If the answer is no, potentially no modification is required. However, this is a big caveat on it as you need to go out and inspect the structure to look for signs of degradation. And is there those signs of distress that would potentially point to the need of repair or strengthening works to be carried out? So what can you do here? Well, you can start off by trying to load balance the structures. Is there any heavy screeds or solid partition walls that can be removed? and replaced with a lightweight option, thus increasing the overall loading capacity of the structure? Or can we modify the loads in the client's brief, slightly modifying it so the heavy loads are located over columns where they'll have the least impact? Or we're having transfer structures over the top onto new transfer beams. Trying to put the transfer loads as close to the existing columns as physically possible, if not directly on top, to remove those transfer loads. Where the biggest impact occurs on a lot of these builds is at the first couple of floors. When you're thinking about an extension up, the elements that are most affected are those first couple of floors at the top as they have the greatest proportion of increase in load from the extension. When you get down near the bottom of the structure, there's already been a lot of accumulative load from the additional floors above them that they only have a minor increase. So columns typically are more critical at the top of the structure than the bottom. Does not mean that you don't need to assess the ones at the bottom, but the increased load is potentially have a lower impact than the ones above. We've tried to load balance the structure, but we still have higher loads that we need to deal with. So this requires us to assess the existing structure in built redundancy. See, most structures have some redundancy in built into them. This is either simplified design where they've designed one beam, but applied it across many elements and potential have residual capacity in those other structural beams where you can apply those additional loads or for buildability. As high variability is hard to build, typically they try and replicate it over and over again to help with the construction to ensure they get it correct. There's also other reasons that you've potentially had additional safety factors in your design. So instead of designing it up to that 80% as required by the material safety factors, you actually only designed it to 60. So you have a residual strength from that 60% to that 80% required by the code. And other reasons potentially may be the availability of stock on site. So sometimes you might not have the exact beam that you need. So they've increased at one size. So there's a residual capacity in your structures. Typically you'll find that most structures have some residual redundancy in them. After approving the strength of the design, we can look for redundancies in serviceability requirements. If the strength actually works, we may be able to lower the serviceability requirements with having discussions with the client and the certifier about reducing those serviceability requirements on our design. So it may mean that they can't have brittle finishes in certain locations and will not need those structural strengthening requirements to meet those serviceability guides. One of the areas you need to be highly critical of when assessing any existing structure is the lateral stability. Specifically, if you added additional floor, you've squared the force on the structure. So you've exponentially increased the load that the structure needs to resist. And sometimes those older construction has not necessarily been fully assessed with the structural design actions. They've only really taken best practices and guides for designing their structural elements and not perform that full detailed assessment. So this is where you need to take great care in assessing your structure. In addition to this, typical modern techniques of using ductile design may not be appropriate. Is the structure underneath actually designed to be performed in a ductile manner? Does it have the resistance and confinement in the critical locations? Does it have ductile reinforcement? So you can't perform a ductile assessment on your design. And the analysis of any existing structure that you do need to take great care is typically material strengths have changed over time. For example, the reinforcement grades like I've shown here have changed over the years. So you're potentially not using the modern day 500 grade steel that you're expecting. The same thing occurs with steel sizes and the type of strength that you should achieve out of those as well. So it's just about knowing their historical materials and what modifications you need to perform to your design to make sure you're assessing correctly. Another area to be super critical of is loss of lateral restraint on specific elements. For example, if you've got a big stair void coming through that wasn't previously there, so potentially remove the restraint on that wall or column, which may need to be reinstated for structural purposes. So now that we've analyzed the structure, realize that certain elements need to be structurally strengthened. So what do we need to watch out for? The first one and most easiest one is structurally strengthening beams for flexure. And this can be done through applying carbon fiber on the critical surface. However, there is limitations here. You need to first start by analyzing the residual stress in the structure. So providing a re realistic loading on that design. So what live load you're actually expecting at the time of strengthening, hopefully that's limited to none. 
and reducing the SDL as much as possible to reduce the residual stress in your structure. This will allow you to perform additional strengthening beyond what you actually physically need. Carbon fiber is also limited to how much you can structurally strengthen it by about 30%. This is for a number of reasons. Well, firstly, carbon fiber is a brittle failure as when it fails, it's a snapping failure with minimal to no warning. So there is additional factors you need to consider when assessing the carbon fiber applied to your structure. And the second is the fact that when it's glued on there, it doesn't perform well under fire. So you need to limit the structure to make sure it has a residual capacity in a fire situation. Another key aspect that I would say to be concerned of is if you're applying it to the top surface, how do you protect that carbon fiber from damage? As it's relatively brittle, it will get damaged over time if it's worn or traffic area. So this is where I'd recommend you either chasing in reinforcement in the top of the beams or chasing in carbon fiber rods where possible. The assessment of vertical elements such as columns or walls. And again, you need to start off by assessing the residual stress in the structure. So where you're currently sitting under a realistic load and how much differential do you have before you get to that failure point. As potentially you may need to increase the safety factors on the new elements you're adding into design based on that differential. And also how much load share are you going to get between your existing structure and your new structural element. As adding additional structural elements doesn't mean that it'll necessarily attract the load. The load attracted to it is based on its stiffness. So for a vertical element is how much elastic shortening it has is how much load it will attract based on the balancing proportion of that. And typically if you're adding steel elements against a concrete element, the steel element is much smaller. So we typically experience a lot more elastic shortening under the similar applied load. So sometimes you need to oversize the structural elements to strengthen the structure efficiently. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest patrons that have come help support the channel, Emmanuel, Odie and Cav. So if you sign up to Patreon, what do you get? You get more access to me, some behind the scene content and potential future members only Q and A's. I hope to see you over there. And as always, I hope you like, comment and subscribe and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.